this, the purpose of the series overall was, uh, we thought it was important in the context of COVID-19, which of course exposed on the one hand, a number of pre-existing conditions in our cities, which are a reflection of incredibly badly managed processes of urbanization, uh, but also pointed to an opportunity to think a lot more radically, to think a lot more propositionally about how does one avoid getting into the situation in the first place. And so in the spirit of not wanting to waste a crisis, the idea was to assemble a number of leading African thinkers and practitioners to share with us in conversation um, their thoughts on what does their practice help us to understand better and how can we think in a more holistic framework in terms of transformation. Now, we've curated this to start off with understanding what the big opportunity was. So that was the first conversation. And um, that happened uh, a, a couple of weeks ago. And what emerged from that was really that we are indeed at a, at a very significant cusp moment where there's agreement um, across the continent that the kind of aspirations that are embedded in Agenda 2063 which are consistent with the other global agreements, in fact requires a much more propositional approach to sustainable urbanism. And that there's a real opportunity to set a number of propositions on the table and to mobilize resources and institutions and partnerships to advance that. However, in the second session, we were trying to ground ourselves to, not, to kind of not get um, seduced by nice sounding discourses, but to be reminded that we have a whole set of pre-existing institutions that most of our cities and political systems are overdetermined by very acute power asymmetries um, between a variety of different interest groups. And that we have to confront these historically driven political economy factors if we are gonna make progress in translating some of these policy ideals into operational uh, agendas. We then last week focused specifically on one aspect of that agenda of transformation, which is this idea of sustainable infrastructure. And the reason we focused on that is because one, it is where the bulk of the resources will go over the next uh, couple of decades to give effect to the ambitions of Agenda 2063. But it is also the opportunity we have to fundamentally reframe and rethink and repurpose our operating systems within our cities and towns and settlements, whether it is hard infrastructure networks or it is the social cultural infrastructures that enable citizenship and a sense of belonging. Now at the heart of that agenda is not just a set of technical requirements, financial architectures and so forth, but in fact is the people, is the ordinary Africans who have been able despite a set of adverse conditions to craft livelihoods, to have a foothold in the city, to activate a whole set of social networks and relationships and affiliations to help them not just navigate, but also these complexities and challenges and urban poverty and inequality, but also live full lives, live lives full of aspiration, full of beauty, full of desire, full of aesthetics. And it is that rounded understanding of the African urban citizen that we wanna draw on today. And the way we wanna get at that is through practice, is through experiences, is through a number of, of actors who are leading organizations doing some of the most cutting edge work on the continent. Um, in the first instance, we will turn to a social movement in Cape Town um, called the Social Justice Coalition. And we're very honored to welcome the director, Mandisa Dianki. And um, we will focus in her reflection specifically on questions of, of advocacy. How does a contemporary social media savvy, dare I say, social movement uh, deal with one of the most intractable challenges in Cape Town, which is sanitation and the lack of safety in one of the poorest parts of the city, Kailicha and associated townships. Um, the CVs of all of our speakers are on the website and it's going to take too much of our precious time for me to speak to the uh, fantastic track records. So I'm just going to introduce the speakers very briefly. 
After Cape Town, we will then travel all the way to Port Harcourt in Nigeria. And we welcomed you with some of the music and production and creativity uh, from uh, the young people in that particular city. And we inviting uh, the founding director of CMAP, um, which is the, well, now I'm gonna forget, media platform is somewhere in the name, but Michael Wimendimo will remind me of what it is that I forgot. Um, but I'm incredibly, uh, it's an enormous pleasure to welcome Michael back. We've been working together on a number of things over the years and I'm an, an enormous fan of, of their work and I've written a little bit about it. And I just want everybody else to know about the, the incredible practice. Um, and there we will focus specifically on how culture and aesthetics is used to animate communities and especially young people in one, I think must be one of the most intractable uh, cities in, on the continent, um, ruled as it is by petrol capitalism. We then move across the continent to the Eastern side. And again, an enormous pleasure to welcome a dear friend and colleague, uh, Joy Mboya, who's the executive director of Godown Arts Foundation in Nairobi, Kenya. And uh, Joy is a veteran of this uh, field of cultural policy, artistic practice. She's a performer herself and has been, if you will, really stuck in the messy realities of her particular city and just plugging away for a very long time. And through that practice and through that willingness to, to get contaminated, I guess, with the kind of messiness of our politics, she's been able to make enormous strides in both building a vision for how communities can be activated through the arts, but also how one interfaces with public institutions uh, despite inertia. And then our final destination in our grand Pan-African tour today is uh, to the island state Mauritius. And we've got Gaetan Sue, who is also a dear colleague that I've known for a long time. And one of the leading uh, African thought leaders on sustainable urbanism and has also represented Africa uh, on a various global fora, but particularly as um, uh, in his capacity as the Secretary General of the African Union of Architects is the, the past uh, Secretary General. And he also serves as the special envoy to UN Habitat for Mauritius. And finally, and, and the capacity that he's speaking today is as chairperson of the Port Louis Development Initiative, which takes us then from the grassroots and these practices into what some of the partnerships arrangements might be if we really want to activate civil society on the continent. So without further ado, um, I will get us going for today and just make one final remark that you can comment on all of the reflections in the chat box. Um, and you can then during the Q&A time indicate by raising your hand that you wanna make a contribution or share a comment or ask a question. And then the moderator, my colleague uh, Alma Vivius will unmute you and you'll be able to ask your question. And then a final uh, uh, um, announcement before I hand over to Mandisa is that um, uh, unfortunately uh, the Social Justice Coalition has been struck by tragedy this week. So Mandisa lost one of her comrades, one of her colleagues uh, was passed away this week and there's a memorial service that will start in, in 45 minutes. And uh, Mandisa as director of the SJC is of course expected to be there and uh, to mourn with her comrades. And uh, so she will sort of share her reflections with us. We'll then open up for some question and answer time. And then she will unfortunately have to exit uh, today's conversation. And we're enormously grateful that despite the tragedy, Andisa, you're still able to join us. So please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, colleagues. Um, you've just made me a bit emotional, so <laughs> excuse me. Um, um, thank you so much for, for inviting me, Edgar. Um, I don't take this opportunity very lightly. Um, thank you, colleagues, for, for sharing your knowledge with us as well. I'm very sorry that I have to leave you guys early. Um, I would have loved to be part of this discussion. Maybe let me jump right into it and introduce um, what the SJC is and just a bit about the work that we've done. Um, Edgar has generously given us 
a guide of how to go about this. So I think my job will be fairly easy. So the SJC um, was formed in 2008 um, to respond to xenophobic attacks at the time. Um, so it was a group of um, community members together with community-based organizations that came together to understand um, what the causes were those of those attacks were and how we move forward as communities. And so after responding to that and trying to get the government to respond and all the relevant stakeholders, um, and after everything had died down, there was a need for us to think through how do we intervene as citizens and, and as um, community members to the challenges that face our communities. And maybe two of the most pressing um, challenges at the time came up and there was a decision to focus just on those two. And those two were access to basic services for informal settlement dwellers and access to safety for informal settlement dwellers. Um, and when we spoke about access to basic services, the most pressing thing at the time was access to basic sanitation. Um, not just access to basic sanitation, but access to basic dignified sanitation services um, and what, what, it, what that looked like. Um, and it was important to sort of marry that with the question of safety because um, those things intersected in a very interesting way in Kailicha and in most other townships across, across South Africa. In that we had cases of people that were being killed, um, raped, robbed on their way to accessing a toilet. Um, because toilets were far from where people stayed, uh, or people had no toilets altogether and they had to use a bush um, to relieve themselves. And so a question came to say, what does um, dignified basic sanitation services look like? Um, and the fact that people don't have access to something as basic as a toilet, how does that speak to someone's right to dignity? And what, what, was, what was the role of ourselves as communities, but also the role of government um, in making sure that people's dignities were respected, but also that people's right to safety um, was made a reality for them. Um, and so a campaign started that was called local government campaign because it focused on basic services. And like I said, at the time, what we were focusing on was access to basic sanitation. Um, and so what that entailed, maybe let me backtrack a bit and say, I think at, at the heart of what we are trying to do and what we were trying to do at the time um, was build people's power not just as it relates to sanitation or, or the voice that we have collectively to demand sanitation, but the voice that we have collectively to demand dignified living for everyone. And so the focus was in informal settlements and the question was, how do we continue to build people's power in informal settlements? to make sure that people are in a position um, to, to, to articulate their own demands. And I'm saying this understanding, I'm always uncomfortable with claiming that we are teaching people anything and, and um, placing ourselves as teachers and saviors. We are not. We are interested in how we provide a space where a movement of informal settlement dwellers is built. Um, for people to be able to demand things like sanitation, which we have already started with sanitation and we have seen over the years, as much as we are not where we want to be, but over the years we have seen people being able to hold their um, authorities accountable um, through things like Maybe Edgar, I will touch on, on your questions that you provided through this 
<laughs> because it looks all meshed together in my mind now. Um, so this, this articulation of people's demands um, through their own voice um, became important for us. But we had to think through what are the ways in which we do that. I mean, there's, there's a general way in which we South Africans express our dissatisfaction and that is a big demonstration and marches and protests. And there's a place for that, right? But over the years, it's clear that uh, protests and mass action isn't as effective as it used to be. And it needs to be accompanied by other strategies so that what we want, um, we can achieve. So maybe one of the examples I want to give is, is um, how we've used social audits um, to, be, to, 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 to broaden this space where people are able to hold um, the powers that be accountable. Please um, hold me accountable with time so that I, <laughs> I know where I'm at. Uh, the social audit really is a way in which um, communities can understand um, their services, the services that they receive. Not only that, but are able to hold um, the government accountable. And in most cases, social audits are used to, to, to monitor services that are outsourced. So for instance, with the question of sanitation, um, as a first step, you will find that what people get is chemical toilets or portable toilets. And that is a service that is outsourced by the city of Cape Town given to a private contractor to, to provide that service. And there is a, a service delivery agreement um, between the city and, and um, the service provider. And so what the social audit does is for people to be able to access that information, to understand what the agreement between the um, service provider and the city is, and to audit and to monitor whether or not this is the kind of service they, they, are, they are receiving. So sort of monitoring the value for money, are they getting the value that um, the service provider is being paid for? Um, and so at the end, the social audit is amazing in that it, it allows the community members to be the people that are doing the monitoring, comparing what is on the ground and what is on paper. And at the end of that, it normally takes two weeks. The first week is the training and understanding of the processes. Um, the second week is the actual people going um, to their public toilets um, in all of the community, assessing their state, um, comparing to what um, the agreement between the city and the service provider says. And at the end of that process, there is a public meeting between all the relevant stakeholders where community members are making a presentation of their own fundings. And if, if um, there are questions and, and, and um, there are holes, be, in, in what they have found, then ask questions to, to, to their um, government representatives to say, this is what we are finding out on the ground, but this is the agreement between you and the service provider, you know, so that, um, so that the government can be held accountable and that the service provider themselves can account for the quality of service that they give to people. But maybe secondly, another thing that I wanted to, to highlight as a strategy for us as, as far as sanitation is concerned has been to make submissions to the city of Cape Town's budget process. Um, and we, we, we struggled with this at the beginning because it wasn't, it wasn't something that was um, a norm for citizens, especially citizens in the informal settlements and the outskirts of the city to make submissions to, to the city's budget. And so at first we had to go door to door um, across Kailicha and other townships to say, look, the city's budget process is coming up. What would you like to see being prioritized by the city in as far as service delivery is concerned for you as a person? And so we'd get different testimonies um, from the people to say, for instance, my toilet stinks and it's cleaned um, once a week. I would like to see um, the cleaning 
of toilets being prioritized. Or I'd like the city to set money aside to give us full flush toilets so that we don't have this problem of, 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 of chemical toilets that get dirty and need to be cleaned constantly. And this way, um, we managed to get all the different voices of the citizens of the city um, heard at council level which in the previous years was really not something that was heard of. At first, when we started, um, there were like 300 submissions, I think, across the city. Um, in 2016, 17, um, when the last time we counted, we had been able to collect over 3,000 submissions to the city of Cape Town. And that for us was a breakthrough in that for the first time, many of the city's citizens could influence um, the direction in which the budget took. And that meant that um, not only are the people that pay rates that get um, prioritized, but even other people that stay in informal settlements get to have their voices heard in that um, process. And so maybe those are the two examples that I wanted to highlight in terms of how, um, how we've done our, how we've managed to bring pressing issues to, 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 um, to the attention of government. In terms of, of victories and failures, I think the, the progress that we've made with the sanitation work um, on its own is a victory. But because we've had fights with the city so much, we fight so much with the government. Um, with the sanitation court case, we had to take them to court because nothing was moving at some point. And so as much as we try to run away from litigating as much as possible, there are cases where the only resort available is, is litigation. And so we took the city to court in 2016 and that case delayed so much that to this point it hasn't been finalized. But I think the, the value in that and the victory in that is that at this point, um, we managed to get to a point where we go to a mediated process. And this was suggested by the city to say maybe instead of fighting in court, let's come around the table and think through what a plan for dignified sanitation services for people staying in, in informal settlements looks like. And I think this, this is a victory because it's not going to be just a, a debate between the city and the SJC and the communities we represent, we represent, but it's going to be a process of consultation between the SJC organizations like the SJC, experts in the sanitation sector, the city, and all other relevant stakeholders so that um, there are so many people that are looking at it from different angles. And I think that's and a very helpful sorry, process. I just need you okay. to uh, pull it together and then, uh, yeah, just I just wanted to share one reflection and then, yeah, just, okay. I'm just also worried about your time. My time. Yeah. So <laughs> I think I was wrapping up already. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. In terms of failures, I don't think, I, I don't view any of the things that happened to us as a field. There are delays here and there, and um, the environment changes and the context changes, and we need to regroup and rethink our strategies. Um, so I wouldn't really point out anything mm -hmm. as a failure in particular. I think I will end there. Um, and right. I'll have to, well, yeah. right. I'm sorry. Thanks, for, Wendy. No, no, no. All fantastic. And, um, uh, just to to maybe make one additional remark, um, uh, which will be interesting for our audience, um, uh, and and I guess um, uh, just one question from my side, and if that's okay, to just uh, take a few more minutes. Uh, so the one aspect um, that 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 was, uh, you know, Mandisa didn't talk that much about the protest side of the work, which has been very imaginative. Um, but one of the campaigns I remember most vividly and which I think was absolutely novel in the case of Cape Town and, um, and demonstrated the importance of drawing attention to struggles of the urban poor in the middle classes and in their imagination. So they had a protest where they, through a social media campaign, 
uh, informed everyone to go and queue at the public toilet in Seapoint, which is the pristine, you know, sort of part of the city for tourists mainly and so on. And the city had spent on the upgrading of this public toilet on the promenade um, three times or four times as much as the total budget for communal toilets in Kailicha in that fiscal year. And to draw attention to that, they created this incredibly long line at this public toilet in Seapoint and sort of used a, a, a sort of social media based crowdsourcing to get hundreds and thousands of people to just stand in the queue for the toilet. And I, I remember it was, you know, never seen before in Cape Town and it just really demonstrated it brought to light because the media covered the story, the press covered, but through that, you know, a light was shone on uh, the, the injustice in the budget allocation uh, for sanitation in Cape Town. So anyway, it's just one little, one of my favorite examples. But I think the point here is the combination of these different strategies and how they hang together as a flexible portfolio. Um, maybe just my last question uh, to you, Mandisa, um, is, you know, so I think the fact that the city has committed to a sanitation strategy and that this is going to be developed through this mediated process and so forth, um, is your sense that, um, that they are willing to reallocate CapEx from other line items to address just the, this extreme problem in the city? And again, for the audience, the context here is that sanitation comprises only about 2% of the total capital budget of the city of Cape Town, but something like the, the infrastructure for the bus rapid transit system um, you know, uh, it chows up something like 20, 25% of the CapEx budget. So, so there's a real prioritization problem within how the city uh, budgets and so on. Um, so, so I guess my question, Mandisa, is if the resources, if that discussion is not about the total quantum, but just about the reallocation within the existing amount for sanitation, that's obviously gonna mean it's gonna take a very long time for them to solve the problem. Um, so is the issue about the larger CapEx budget part of the discussion and what the prioritization is for the city or is it too soon to tell? I do think it's too soon to tell, but okay. I want to point out that the fact that um, the city is willing to go to this mediated process on its own for me is points to a willingness to, to engage but also maybe to, it does say that the city does see um, that there is an urgent need for this that needs to be, to be um, addressed soon. And so in terms of, I mean, there's, there really is a problem with prioritization in the city, but in terms of what that process looks like at this point, um, we are not sure. But I think what, what maybe is important is that we will sit together and develop a plan um, and a plan that represents all the different um, stakeholders that um, are involved in this process. I don't yeah. know if I'm answering your question. No, you are, absolutely. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, so just we've taken five more minutes of your time than what was possible, but thanks so much, Mandisa, and we wish you and your comrades well. and. And yeah, I, I'm sure it will be a very meaningful uh, time that you will share with each other uh, later today. Uh, please accept our condolences. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, comrades. And thank you to everyone. Okay, thanks. Bye. Um, so we now move from Cape Town to Port Harcourt, uh, another port city, I guess. Um, we only, yeah, no, Nairobi's the exception today. Otherwise we, we have only port cities. Um, and we're gonna, um, we, we can experiment a little today. We've never done this, so we're going to try and show some video. Um, so, uh, Michael, welcome, and the floor is yours, and I'm sure you and Alma have figured out how to do the video. You're on mute, I think. Hi. Hi. Hello. So, um, I want to speak less and show more. Um, we have a, a short two minute video that I think might usefully and graphically situate 
the project for those people who don't know where Port Harcourt is or, or what it's like. Um, so it'd be great if uh, maybe Alma could just play the video. Sure. I don't actually see Alma there anymore. Yeah, that's so. true. I'm also wondering. Uh, okay. I could, I okay. could um, play it from here. Okay, and just make sure the, if we, yeah, if the, um, actually, yeah, uh, actually, uh, sorry, Amazon, Amazon. yeah, she's just sent to WhatsApp, her internet crashed, she's trying to reconnect, so that's, uh, you know, Murphy's Law, so I think let's do it from your, from your side. Okay, okay, let's give it a go, um, I'll share my screen, if I'm allowed, it's host disabled, so, okay. and uh, I'm uh, the host. Uh, okay, I think. <laughs> so we're gonna, yeah, she is. Um, okay, so maybe we're gonna have to just uh, sorry, Edgar, think on up. Yes, it seems I'm the host. Yes, um, I think it it says, was oh, okay. okay, yeah, so, so you, can, you can make Michael the host or you can make me the host. So, okay, uh, you can make the screen, host. share screen and then uh, allow all participants to share. Okay, yeah, uh, should I, I should I just make Edgar the host? Edgar, should yeah, I just make you host? That's also fine. Yeah. Okay, so so I'm making okay. you host. Okay. This feel like, okay, this so feels like a performance <laughs> art piece here, where we're commenting on the absurdities of Zoom. So, so there you go. So, go Ed, so Edgar's host, host now. now. Okay. Yeah. So Michael, <laughs> it's, it's the it's the second one you shared with me, right? So I can play that. Yes. Ah, Alma's back. Hi, Alma. Okay. okay. Let me. Um, Hi. Hi, I'm back, yes. Okay, Welcome. so are you going to share or? Yeah, we were just debating who should do it. Did you play the first video, Alma, if you've, if you've got that to hand? Not that one. Not this one, yeah, that's the other one. And if you just do command F, go full screen. Yeah. Not hearing any audio. Uh, there's no sound, Alma. I'm not sure if you. Uh... Alma, do you want to just pause? There's no sound. Maybe uh, we can do it from Michael's side, and then uh, if he's uh, if his gear is set up to also play sound, because there's a setting in Zoom that you've got to do both audio and sound if you play video. Um, do you want me to give it a go? Do you want me to give it a go? Sorry, just give me a moment. Um, I'm switching to computer sound. Can you share screen, Michael? Um, okay. In the dark time, when I be singing, yeah, yeah, that was singing, yeah, about the dark times. In the dark time, when I be singing, yeah, yeah, that was singing, yeah, about the dark times. Decide to make a living, but we live. That's how we gon' make it through the pandemic. The cash you can have, that rally was loud. Politics is now a form of fraud. Black suits in the air, Brits. The boss stays, but the rich get richer. I choose.
decisions not to be enslaved. But situations and decisions that I make. Yeah. In the dark times. Would I be singing? Yeah, yeah. Don't be singing. Yeah. About the dark times. In the dark times. Would I be singing? Yeah, yeah. Don't be singing. Yeah. About the dark times. Story, story, story. A monkey stole some money in Nigeria, about a million. Then he called his G. Snakey, snakey. Even you can cash out at the six with no P. All you need is God, security and SARS. Fly your kids to France. And power talks for killing of the opposition parties. Power to the people, by the people, and for the people. That's why when the people travel out, they start flying eagles. Never to come back. Why? In the dark times, would I be singing? Yeah, yeah, they were singing. Yeah, about the dark times. In the dark times, would I be singing? Yeah, yeah, they were singing. Yeah, about the dark times. Well, not quite the fluid experience we'd planned. You know, I, we spent a lot of time on optical flow, trying to get out the judders in the flyover, but you know, that's Zoom. Anyway, um, I hope it gives you some sense of the, the place. And I think at the outset, it's important to mention that this place is the oil capital of Nigeria. And Nigeria is not a developmental state. Nigeria is a predatory extractive state. And I think that's, that's important to grasp at the outset. Nevertheless, it is nominally a democracy. So voice and visibility do count for something as I think the recent anti-police brutality protests demonstrate. So, what we have set out to do here is to build platforms for community voice, to allow communities that have been overlooked to, to make themselves seen and heard. So if I'm allowed to share my screen, um, I'll just show you a, a very few uh, images to give you a sense of the different project components. And if I'm not allowed to share my screen, I will just tell you about the different project components. Um, and then just think a little bit about um, our, our strategy and how we've, we've approached that. So the project's called the Human City Project, the broad frame. And the idea was simply to let people in, ordinary people, to allow them to make themselves seen and heard in a city that they for the most part, have built themselves. And there are a number of components. There's Chikoko Radio, which is a largely youth-based community radio platform, which is building citywide audiences. Chikoko Studios, which is our music program. Chikoko Cinema, which at the moment is our inflatable pop-up cinema, uh, internet on the streets, and layering the different forms of representation, not only the cinematographic, but also the cartographic, and Chicago Maps allows people to research and describe clearly their current situation and to, to map out future possibilities. For us, it's important not only to build representations, but to spatialize those. Our, our first modest attempt was, was the shed. And at the moment, we're in the first stages of building Chikoka space, which is going to be our media center in the most exciting building in the city. The challenge of, of coming together to, to build in a time when coming together is, is difficult, is, is something we're going to have to work through. Now, the, the, the media 
Centre, we hope, will be the first phase of a multi-phase community development plan. And each phase should involve all the elements that we want to realise at every level from individual building through to, to city scale. So renewable energy, sustainable sanitation, clean water, facilities for nutritional and cultural production, and importantly, public space for popular participation. So as I say, Chicoco space is gonna be uh, our first modest uh, attempt modest in the grand scheme of things, but for us, nevertheless, um, a big, a big step. The plan is that this media center, which will be solar powered, which should produce an excess of energy and clean water and, and so on, should be, become the hub of a community service infrastructure system, which will provide power, water, waste services to the neighborhood. And the, this building will be bordered by and incorporate, for example, an urban farm, which will feed into the canteen, the community canteen in the center. And then the, that in turn will feed into a bioway system to produce more energy and fertilizer for the food production spaces. And that this hub is owned and operated by the people that live in work there in partnership with Chicoco Collective, which is uh, a mashup of NGO and community association. And the idea is that the media component of that should amplify the story and, and, and all the other elements. If we can successfully complete that plan in one neighborhood, we will have built not only a demonstration model, but hopefully that, that model, that unit, will itself be a node in an expanding network of other such nodes. And our route to scale is not by doing the same thing bigger and bigger, but by doing lots of small things in concert and networking them to, to city scale, because it's clear to us that, for example, the city's sanitation crisis is not going to be solved by a one or two billion dollar central sewerage system. It's going to be solved, if it's solved at all, by a number of on-site services that are manageable at neighborhood and, and community level and strategically networking those. And I think we can speak with some authority about the sanitation situation in the city because our community mapping team carried out the technical assistance program for a World Bank funded sanitation project in the city, which perhaps we can talk a, a little more about um, later. I think just, just three reflections on our process. In none of these reflections, I think, will come as a surprise to anyone, but one, we found it much easier to mobilize thousands of people, get them out onto the streets in a tick when their homes were immediately threatened by bulldozers and bullets. Right? When, when the city, as it was at the beginning of this project, was in a really hot crisis, and you could fully expect to wake up and see bulldozers outside your door, mobilization was, was massive and rapid. And the challenge is how to get people as excited about building a toilet as keeping the roof over their heads. I think that challenge is, is related to our, our next observation, that in many ways, we found it easier to support makers rather than reformers or artists rather than, than activists. It's been easier for us to support people who want to do something because they love doing that thing 
making a film, making a, a song, uh, even making a map, making a radio program. Now, of course, the things that they're making are special in as much as they're vehicles of meaning and hopefully tools which can be used to, to mobilize. But those aspirations for making seem for many people much closer to hand and closer to home than activism or advocacy in, in some sense. And I think that's not surprising because many people here, rather than struggling to make an abstract claim of formal rights, are struggling to occupy a particular place in the city, an actual, an actual place. So the, the things that the people we're working with are making, I think are important in realizing this broader vision because in many respects, they constitute visualizations. They allow people to see what is possible. They're technologies of, of political imagination in many ways. And what we build demonstrates what is possible and creates a space that people can occupy so that they can experience what is possible. Just, just the last comment on digital platforms. I mean, you know, we're, we're modest. What we're making is not a digital platform, uh, Viral Times, our, our new, our new uh, project. It's not a digital platform in the sense that we, we talk about platforms nowadays, like Facebook. It, it's a website, right? Nevertheless, it's, it's a space where participants can see themselves as seen they can they can recognize themselves as recognized and visible and, and that on a local level has been really important the participants are very excited about the new platform it's also proved useful in making connections internationally i mean already we've had we've had um uh, actually yesterday we had a visitor from a, a professor a musicologist who is looking at the relationship between music, environmental activism, and, and protest in general. So it, it allows us to be visible to audiences who wouldn't necessarily know what we're doing in this place, which I call the center of the edge of the world. So um, I hope that's given us stuff to, to talk about. There's a two minute video that I would have suggested we watch, which has the participants describing it in their own words in, in song, but given the, the choppiness of our channel, I think maybe we'll just uh, leave the bandwidth for conversation. Great, thanks, Michael. Um, and uh, yeah, pity that we can't do that, but I wanna encourage people to please visit the website. Uh, the materials are, are all there. Um, so there are a few questions and a sort of one cluster revolves just around the basic funding model. How are you funded? And what's the prospects of viability over the, over the long term? And then secondly, your relationship with government, especially when there's protests and given uh, the nature of the state as you've described it. If you can maybe deal with those two questions first and then um, you can read through the comments while you spoke and then while we go over to Joy and uh, yeah. Okay, first of all, our relationship with the government. I mean, in 2009, it was obviously a very adversarial relationship. It was, it was, uh, it was violent um, and intense, but it was clear to us very early on that it was strategically necessary to move from opposition to proposition, to move from saying no to false predictions, urgent and necessary as that was, to saying yes to particular models of participatory development. So we worked very hard at engaging the state government, which is the, the level of government that has primacy in Nigeria over urban development. And we actually have a formal technical cooperation agreements with, with key ministries. Now, I, I say formal because the substance of those um, is not necessarily rich. Uh, while 
at the technical level, there's there's lots of goodwill and indeed um, some capacity. At the level of, of the government, the, the absence of vision and capacity is, is staggering. Uh, that's why it, it's all, it always makes my head spin when, when I'm in conversation with people from South Africa or, or indeed from, from Kenya, because th there is a difference at that level in, in terms of the possibilities of, of discourse with the, with the state. So we're working hard on the one hand to engage the state. On the other hand, we're working hard to hold them accountable. We took the government to the ECOWAS court and, and won. So um, engagement and, and accountability um, are key. In, in terms of strategy for long-term sustainability in, in that connection, for us, it's really clear that if something is going to be sustainable in, in the long term, you have to do it first. You have to make the thing. It has to operate. It has to have a momentum of its own. And then you can invite the government to participate, even to own it if they like. But it has to, you can't wait for all the institutional stars to align because that would simply never happen. You have to just, just do it. In terms of funding, nothing particularly innovative there. I mean, uh, we've had some, some wonderful and very responsive support from GIZ. Cities Alliance were great in the early stages. And it's excellent to see Serge Alou, who's, who's here, who was really very uh, supportive uh, in the early stages. So we've, we've had kind of donor uh, development agency and, and, and big donor support. We also had support from Comic Relief. Most recently and most significantly, we had uh, quite a, a large grant from the Novo Foundation to their Radical Hope Fund. And that for the first time was a general support grant rather than, than particular project funding. And that's been, been really helpful, but we are still, always have been, and, and still working beyond our capacity. And we're always just one step away from having uh, no beans in the tin. Thanks, Michael. And uh, I did note one of the questions was where were you currently, whether you're in London or Port Harcourt, but I think the chickens oh, in the oh, background uh, gave it away. <laughs> so, uh, so, so I think the, the chickens uh, sort of, you know, it's, it's like yeah. for witness. So yeah, so that question has been addressed. So lots of parallels and overlaps with uh, the Godan Arts Foundation initiative in Nairobi. So without further ado, I welcome Joy to share her reflections with us. And Michael, if you in the meantime want to just peruse the chat box and see if there's anything else you want to pick up specifically uh, when we open up for question and answer later. Um, thanks, uh, Joy, welcome. Thank you. So thank you, Edgar, and thank you, um, everyone. Yeah, so, so yeah, the Godan Art Center, we are based in Nairobi. And I think, as Edgar indicated, we are not a port city. But the origins of Nairobi is because a port city, Mombasa, in 1896, was the beginning of a, an enterprise that actually resulted in the formation of, of Nairobi, which was the laying down of a railway line um, under the British protectorate that was trying to get to Uganda, which was of course seen as fertile productive lands and Kenya was just a, a by the way. And when they got to Nairobi, they encountered the Rift Valley and had to kind of re-strategize and think about how they were going to cross that particular um, escarpment. And so Nairobi was born. So yes, we do have a relationship with Port City in some way. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I think I will, I will, I will just speak. I won't share um, any images or, or video. Um, and and I, I think I'll speak to probably two things. Um, one will be really how we have forged relationships with the communities of Nairobi and why. And the second will be around building relationships with public authorities. But I think before, before going there is to probably just say a little bit about about our own, our own practice and, and trying to find and define who we are. Um, I find it hard to, to say we're an art center because I really don't know what that is actually. But um, just so that people understand that we look at things through the perspective of arts and culture, 
um, and that's the approach you know through which we we, we sort of um, engage things then then maybe art center is is correct but maybe a more accurate uh, probably definition is that we are an experiment um, I think I like to 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 describe ourselves as unfolding and emerging rather than having a deliberate sort of direction that as we as we sort of do something and understand um, what we've done, um, we then take the next step. So our practice is actually very um, iterative in approach. Uh, we, we observe a lot, we, we try to pay attention a lot, we, we try to facilitate others and then see what that means. And we also try to, to reflect a lot. Um, and I think this came about because, uh, you know, as Michael has described, somebody asked, where does funding come from? Our funding, when we first started, also came from um, international foundations. It came from the West. It was funding for the arts, um, I think, with an expectation that we would look um, like our art practices in the West. And I think as we began to, to sort of find our own selves and roots, we have been interrogating this thing and sort of trying to see what should we look like? Um, what, what is an art center in an African city? What does it do? Um, how does it engage its audiences? How does it participate in the city? How is it of the city? Um, so, so, so Nairobi, the city is very important to us. We see it as, as the, the kind of the media in which we are very much immersed. Um, and the city's origins, of course, uh, have an impact on the way that the city is, is, is currently arranged, the way the city currently operates, the way that um, city citizens see themselves. And these are things that we, we think are important for us to also be aware of and to engage because we are also the city of the city. Um, so, so the process of city making is something that we, we define ourselves to be very much a part of. In fact, we go further and say that we, we are part of the process of nation making as well. Um, so we started this so, sort of more intentional and intensive interrogation about um, 10 years ago. Um, things happen slowly, or maybe they don't, maybe, maybe it's just how we read time. Um, but 10 years ago, we started to look at this, this idea of, um, of, of our own meaningfulness and our own engagement with, with the city and with Nairobi. And I think um, Edgar, having of course engaged with you and, and now also reading your own work, um, I think one of the things that I'm finding very useful is the terminology that um, that, uh, that you speak about in, um, or an approach in, in um, the book, New Urban Worlds that you've done with um, uh, Simone, where you talk about redescription. Um, and so this idea of, of, of looking at things, um, not just at how they appear, but that they might be very different than what you think they are, they are doing or, or, or being. So, so that is kind of a, a useful way of beginning to articulate and find another way, find language to describe what we do. So, so I'll speak about um, one approach in engaging audiences that we, we stumbled upon. And I'll say stumbled upon because again, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't know how to, we didn't know how to begin to find Kenyan audiences and connect with them um, in a way in which our exhibitions would be filled with people and our performances would be filled with people. So we, we said, well, one of the first things we should probably do is, is not assume that, that, that our location is, is the site for activity, that maybe the site for activity is actually where people are. So I think when we understood very early on that the numbers were small, we decided to go into the neighborhoods and we took a, we took a festival into the neighborhood, which was basically a festival of creatives within the neighborhood. So young people who were rappers and um, hip hop artists and um, spoken word artists and um, doing theater. These are the people who stepped onto that stage. It was their stage because we wanted to see what was the community reaction to, 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 to themselves. Um, and also how did, how did the, the artist also appreciate that space of presentation within community. What did that mean? What did that look like? We did this for a number of years. It was actually very successful. Um, 
But then they were happening in particular neighborhoods within the city. There was no interaction across the neighborhoods. Um, and so we began to sort of say, well, how do we, how do we get artists across neighborhoods kind of sitting in, 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 in a new space, performing in a new space to a new audience? And one of the ways that we sort of engineered this was of course, working with big, big name artists and having them kind of rotate. Um, so they would have their neighborhood, of course, where they came from, but then they would perform in another neighborhood and this way, you know, sort of begin to, begin to, um, begin to make a link, albeit a weak one. I think as this experiment of, of finding the, the right space for performance was, was playing out, we, we then had an opportunity to also think about what this meant around changing our own space, because we, we own the space. And we said, if we had a chance to redevelop the art center, um, what should it look like? Um, what should inform its redevelopment? So we then had two processes happening at the same time. The idea of trying to understand Nairobi audiences and the space of presentation um, and neighborhoods, but also the idea of, of trying to think about what we meant and our own relevance in the city and how do we get to a place where we understand how we evolve, how we, how we, how we, how we, how we become. Um, we put out a call uh, to the city sort of saying, um, come up with some good ideas around how we can, we can have an event um, that celebrates who we are as Nairobians. And we had quite a few submissions, about 50 submissions. Um, and so we looked at them and there was a diversity of ideas. And then we thought, ooh, how are we gonna do this? And I think what was sitting in our head at that point was this idea of an exhibition. Um, and then I think it was more of a, of a, an epiphany rather than anything that we kind of analyzed and said, well, let's do it this way. But suddenly I think it became clear that what we were trying to do was going to fail. Um, because if you really were going to represent the city or allow the city to represent itself, then somehow you needed to enable the whole city to be present and to be able to share itself. So this idea of, of um, neighborhood festivals curated by the city um, then, then emerged. So this is the, the framework that we, that we have been using um, for about nine years now, uh, the Nine Who framework, which is basically a thing that says, who is Nairobi? Um, how do we understand who we are? What makes us tick? How do we uh, Joy, your line I think is is slowing down, so maybe what we, what we uh, asked one of the things, yes. Okay. Oh my no, mind no, is slowing down. Yeah, is yeah. It, so it you were, you, no, you it's, were back. it's back. You were frozen there for a oh, okay, sorry. For minute. So if you could just, uh, yeah. Okay, just it was it was my and, internet. Yeah. yeah so no, a quick oh. recap. Yes. So we so then we thought, how do we how do we do this? And of course, it was a question of mobilizing and engaging residents. And the very first point that was clear was that we needed to allow their own agency. So this whole idea of co-curation, of co-curating, of of making them the actors of of the protagonists of of the festival. Um, and the drivers of the festival um, was, was important. Um, so we found uh, ways in which we, we enabled conversations or dialogues that gave um, the neighborhood um, the opportunity to think about what they could show and how they could show it. And a number of different things, of course, came out of this. You know, some decided to map their neighborhood, some decided to, to reflect on their past and recent histories. Um, some decided to do more community-based things like cleaning up. Um, others, of course, decided to engage very directly with, with art itself. I think the second thing that we then, um, over time, I think it was sort of in Nainuhu 3 or Nainuhu 4, was to now very deliberately try and see how do we enable exchange across neighborhoods? Because of course, Nairobi as a colonial city was, was um, planned around segregation, racial segregation. And in the modern city, in the present day city, this of course reflects more as, um, 
class segregation. So you've got your more wealthy neighborhoods and you've got your informal settlements and then you've got your denser sort of middle class and lower middle class neighborhoods. And these again, do not interact so, 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 so much. So again, the question was how do we enable exchange? How do we facilitate that to happen? And one of the, I think the tools that came out of that was the idea of walking tours, which um, the residents themselves um, came up with. And so the idea of, um, of publicizing and advertising a walking tour for, you know, for, for anybody in any part of the city to, 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 to take part in and to begin to appreciate what different neighborhoods offered and what they were like um, has become, I think, a, a, very, a very powerful way of, of, of making those connections. And then I think that the, 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 the third and important thing, which, which then links to the next point that I would like to make around engaging with public authorities, was how does this, how does this contribute to something transformational for the idea of city making? So it's not just that residents have agency and that they are now really begin to, beginning to reflect and think about the cultural assets in their neighborhoods and uh, finding ways in which they this, this, this enables them to think about belonging and pride and, and histories um, and are finding ways to connect. But how does this help us think about the kind of city that we want? So we escalated the mobilization of neighborhoods into a process that was also happening at the same time in the city, which was a, a master plan process that the city of Nairobi had embarked on after almost what, 40 years of, of no new plan, 40, 50 years of no new plan. So the city was now beginning to grapple with the fact that a population of 4 million and growing um, is, is going to need a plan. And, and one of the things of course that had happened was that um, a new urban areas act required that they be the mobilization of people in, 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 in all of these conversations. So we joined these conversations and said that we have been doing this activity, Naini Hu, and we have found a way to, to engage um, with, with residents and maybe this could be a, um, an interface for, for the planning, for, for the city's planning. The city found it difficult to, to, to link into this thing. And so they used their usual method, which is contact the, the local chief, ask him to mobilize a bunch of young people and some of the CBOs, the community-based organizations, and therefore engage people people that way. But then in that engagement, then in terms of the, in terms of um, uh, public authorities, I think that definitely there was a curiosity and an interest in, in this thing that it seemed we were able to do. <laughs> we weren't able to do anything really. All we did was, was, was luck out, if I can call it that, on, a, on, a, on something that, 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 that triggered um, people's reaction and participation. I think, Michael, you spoke about um, threat in, in, in Port Harcourt being um, something that mobilized people. But I think in this instance, I think it was the idea of, of belonging and ownership and pride that even if I'm sitting in an informal settlement, there is something to be proud of. This is home. Now, how do I redescribe, to use your word, um, uh, Edgar there, how do I relook at actually this situation and find the things that, that are me over there? and actually celebrate those and share those. Um, so, so the city was curious around this, this, this kind of trigger point that we seem to have, have um, uh, been able to, 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 to press a button on. So what we then began to do in, in terms of formalizing relationships with city was to strengthen these networks beyond the community-based groups. Within these community-based groups, we found certain groups that were very focused on the question of, of the urban. Uh, there's a group called Nipolitans, you know, that was looking at this whole question of um, um, pedestrianization and cycling and, and, and spaces. Um, there were groups that were looking at the whole idea of public space. Um, so, we, so we began to insert ourselves and connect with those conversations. There were neighborhood associations that were also looking at, at um, issues of the city. Um, so we began to form alliances and, and where we could be part of of similar conversations, we inserted ourselves over there so that when there was a policy discussion, at least there was a group of us who, who felt that we knew each other and we could participate in those policy discussions almost as a collective, even though a very loose one, so to speak. But the other thing that we found very important to do was to understand the kind of 
policy and legislative frameworks that the public authorities lean on and rely on and to understand those and to engage through those as well, because those are the vehicles that they use. So, so we said, we need to understand these things. We need to understand what plans um, are being proposed or envisioned by the city, the city planners, the city officials um, using these, these tools, these policy tools, these policy frameworks, and we need to engage through those as well. So, so we remain very much aware of the fact that there is um, uh, 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 legislation around resident associations and what does it say? We are very much aware of legislation around public space and what does that say? We're very much aware of legislation around cultural actors in the city of Nairobi and what does that say? So we, we engage them through the tools and the frameworks that they have created and that they use and that they, 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 they use as their formal way of, 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 um, of engaging. I think that the other thing that we have done is, is to find a space again where we, we call it the workshop space, where we can talk about things that are common to ourselves. So what is the common ground question? And public space is a big one in the city of Nairobi. So the public space question has been one that we have sort of milked over the last kind of four or five years. How do we create that as a space for conversations between ourselves as non-state actors, our cultural practitioners, residents who are doing other things and public officials? So, so the public space has become a thematic area for, for running workshops, inviting them into workshops, meeting in those workshops to again, begin to understand each other and to discuss some of the things that clearly um, are not understood across you know, the, the public authority space and, the, and, and, and ourselves. But the other space that we found is a very powerful one because again, sometimes we are dismissed is to really lean on the networks that are our funders. So the diplomatic core in Nairobi um, are often big supporters of culture and arts. And we have found ways in which some of those ambassadors become good friends of the work that we do and basically co-conveners of issues that we would like to invite our public officials to. Um, and then that way, you know, you, you find that your, 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 you know, your sort of city planner is more likely to arrive, your minister for culture is more likely to arrive because the invitation is, 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 is through, through the diplomatic core as well. Yeah, so, so, so I think we're still on a journey. I mean, it's, for us, it's still, it's still uh, a process of trying to understand then how do we sit and fit in the city? But where the process is escalated to is that we have reached a place, of course, where we're now moving forward the idea of reimagining the physical go down. And we have basically consolidated the mobilization that we've been able to do over the last 10 years. And to put this um, to use in trying to envision the new go down. So the new go down has been a process of, of engaging city residents in trying to imagine what does an art center look like for them? What does it do? What does it contain? the artists themselves, the public officials, of course, themselves, um, businesses that sit around the go down, you know, that, that were feeding off of artists. So all of these communities, what is their voice in imagining this new institution that we're about to create um, so that hopefully um, we, can, we, can, we, can, we can arrive at something that represents our collective voice. So I think I'll leave it there. Thank you, Joy, for that incredibly eloquent and enrapturing yeah. summary of your process and practice and journey. Um, just because of time, um, I'm going to ask you to just look at the oh, one or two comments or questions uh, that aimed at you, but I'm going to just ask you to reflect on those while Geta does the final contribution, and then we'll have a, a more integrated uh, and fluid discussion with all of the panelists. So it's a great pleasure, Gaetan, to welcome you, and thank you for joining us today. Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon for Mauritius. We are far away, but we are part of Africa too. And, and I must say, it, uh, it's my third session I'm listening to, and it's so enriching each time and, and each time I really feel connected because we, we are not alone. Uh, although Mauritius, you know, is very small compared to 
the big countries of, of the continent, the, the whole population of Mauritius is just a small city in, in Africa, I would say 1.2 million. We are the scale of a, of a small lab, uh, a, a, an urban laboratory, if I may say. But what I've observed is that, you know, the, the, the problems are very similar, maybe in a different scale, but the problems are very similar. And uh, we, we can see that um, to do sustainable urban governance, we need really the same tools, urban, a good urban approach, uh, legal framework, and of course, financial support to be able to achieve that. And across the board, we need proper dialogue with all the stakeholders of the city and of the place. But the, the problem remained the same, and, and uh, the city remained expensive for many people. There are a lot, although it's a place of wealth, it is also a place of poverty because the, the, the inequalities are really uh, huge in some places. But nevertheless, the city remains a catalyst, a platform, and, and a, I would say a platform of opportunities if we have. Uh, if we are able to harness all these, this energy like Michael has been doing with this energy, especially Africa and even in Mauritius, we are uh, a, a young population and, and, and innovation creativity is more connected to the youth. And, and with the gender now being enabled also, this doubles the, the capacity of innovation and creativity. So. What we've been trying to do, uh, I chair uh, an organization which is in fact a, not an NGO but a private company, a private non-profit private company financed by private firms in, in Mauritius, the full private sector, with a specific role. Our role is to supplement everything in terms of creativity, regeneration of the city, which the municipality and the government is unable to do with their, because of lack of funds or lack of time, or it's not on their priority. So this is the part of the city that we deal with. And, and so this company, this small company has tried to do things um, in, in this order. The, the single objective is regenerate the city regenerate in terms of business, in terms of lively liveliness, creativity, and of course, in terms of cultural activity and creativity. So the first task we've tried to do, and, and we are now in a process of, of uh, reaching, um, I would say a successful result, is to recuperate public space in the city. Because like many African cities, we had for a small city like our capital city, like 2000 street vendors taking over all the streets and the pavement. So we've managed now to take all of them, when I say all of them, 100% now out of the street by providing them now with a place, not only a place, but with the funds to be able to become owner from, from their, you know, uh, recuperate this, uh, this public space but from the owners. So, uh, you know, uh, Mauritius has a long, how do you say, long history of collaboration between private sector and public sector. So to be able to achieve that, we said, let's look at the stakeholders, the street vendors, their competitors, the shops, the municipality and the private sector, and what each one we identify common grounds and also co uh, interests of each party. And we managed to find that the shop owners would like them to be off, but the people don't have the money to be there and the private sector would finance taking them off the street. And the municipality and the government were happy to transform the informal people, informal market into formal market giving them a trade license and by the end getting uh, taxes eventually. And we were surprised that these people were ready to take a loan, purchase the place and now be fully registered. And in, in, in next year, by next year, the place is being built. 
next year they will be fully registered and practicing on their own. Now we have more demand with new entrepreneurs because this is the entrepreneur of, of the continent. I think we have the same in, in, in many cities in Africa. These young entrepreneurs now have started new business like startups. And, and, and so they are off the street. So we recuperate the public space that give them work. The second, because of all these people, people didn't want to live in the center, the city center. And now we are putting back, recuperating uh, empty and vacant space to transform, to transform them into apartments. But for the young people, we have now a new legal framework that allows the employer to give them a, um, trans, uh, instead of a transport allowance, we are transforming that into a housing allowance for them to live in the city instead of far away from the city so that they travel less and they work on the spot. Sustain it more sustainable, less traffic, and, and it creates a full livelihood in the middle of the city where the people will go and spend their money and buy food, buy drinks, buy coffee, beer, whatever. And this is the second thing. So work and second live. And the last, which we haven't started yet, is we want to, the city to celebrate. We want the city now to take over. And you know, we have a very diverse population. We have, even if it is a very small place, we have three continents on the island. We like to say it this way, Africa, Asia and Europe, all of the mix of everything. So we have a lot to celebrate. Every single day could be a party if we find the right festival, the right thing to do. And the mixture of all these celebrations would be wonderful. So we have worked with government to create a legal framework to turn all the artists and the creative people into entrepreneurs, give them the same incentives and facilities as the SMEs, the small and medium enterprise, even if they are single person uh, company, we just register them and, and they are entitled to loans to activity and best, they will be given eight year tax holiday if they work and live in the city and practice their, 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 their how do you say their trade, their expertise, or their creativity in the city. And we want to connect them to the private sector and the, and the, the, commu the business community, so that then with digital, and they are all very good in digital, the young people, connect whether radio, music, art, dance, theater, with all this connection and the livelihood, like Joy was saying, also involve the embassy, the diplomatic missions, uh, Alliance Francaise and all um, the, the German people, the Indian, the Chinese, the, all of them participate in this sort of thing. So we are busy, busy um, now uh, trying to, to do that. So we, the, the third and last part, the leave part, we are still at an early stage. So the journey has just started. We are getting momentum. Uh, first, create a living, liberate the space, then bring the people, the young people to live in the city and then finally celebrate. So this is where we are. It's a private initiative and this private initiative is well supported and in a dialogue with both the municipality, the government and all the, the people that are involved. So in a nutshell, Edgar, this is what we are busy with now. And uh, it's been a pleasure talking to all of you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks. Great to hear these um, testimonies of sort of these different practices across the continent. Geta, I'll start with you and jump straight in because I know the question is going to come knowing who participates in these uh, webinars. Um, so the removal of the traders into these markets, um, similar processes have been tried in other parts of the continent and that's kind of read as a form of gentrification um, because of course the reason people are in the street is because of footfall. And if you kind of put people in a market, they don't necessarily have access to the same client base. Uh, I'm curious whether that issue emerged in the negotiations and whether the street traders feel confident uh, that their businesses can be as 
uh, productive or as uh, profitable if they were uh, as, as they, they've been uh, in their previous location. Um, and then I guess the, the second question is whether they, uh, I have no conception of your labor market structure. So in South Africa, you know, 50, 55% of our young people are not employed. They're not in an educational resource. And so the idea of how one thinks of housing solutions for them in well-located parts of the city is a really complicated discussion because they just don't have any income. Um, so I was curious whether, you know, you've got an unemployment challenge at all, or whether it's really about just, you know, how to get people with relatively low incomes to be part of the inner city uh, fabric. Um, yeah, so let me just kick over those two questions to you. And then I'll ask uh, Joy to come back if she wants to respond to some of the questions. And then Michael, there might be some things you want to pick up on as well. Gator. Yes, uh, our unemployment is quite low, though it, it, it is picking up because of the COVID uh, issue now. And uh, it, it's, we are less than 10%. And uh, the young people, uh, ha we have had the chance of free education for a generation now. So the young people are quite educated and this helps them to get a better living. I saw, I, and this is connected to a question which I just see in the chat about the transport to the housing allowance. What we have discussed with the, because a lot of the big uh, companies, they employ a lot of people and then they have, they give them a transport allowance. Sometimes they hire a full bus to bring the people back home and I said to them, no, let's, why don't you rent a place for these people for the same price mm -hmm. and then let them live in the city uh, in the weekend they can go home or whatever but the whole week they live in the city some are agreeable to purchase the apartment instead of transforming the allowance into a transport allowance so it, it becomes a, an asset a physical asset for them in the city so it's a win-win thing and we have asked government to 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 uh, diminish the taxes on on the housing also which help them to purchase you know vat is uh, will be removed on the on the housing unit so it's 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 a, a dialogue between all the stakeholders so that we are able to achieve that i forgot to mention that we managed to discuss that the whole city center has been now transformed into a legal framework which is like a special economic zone but for every, every uh, for dedicated specific activities and for dedicated area and for dedicated um, uh, landowners. Great, thanks. Um, uh, Joy, do you wanna uh, come back at some of the questions? Yeah, I think maybe just, just two things that I see in the panel. Well, I think one is talking about asking whether aren't the arts, isn't, it, isn't there always a risk that the arts will be, you know, the exclusive domain of, of the middle classes? Um, and, and, and also, I think a second one around asking about how the official engagement always comes after, you know, sort of um, the work that we're doing has, has started. I think on the first one, I think that, that the, you know, the exclusivity of the arts, I think that's the very question that we are asking. And I think that's why when I started, I said, I don't know how to describe or define what art means. Um, I think the question suggests that there is, there is a certain model of the arts and I suspect that it's probably a Western one. Um, and that's the one that we're trying to understand. What does, what does it look like for contemporary nations, contemporary cities, African cities? What does this question of art look like? But in our own practice, the, I mean, the most active groups that, you know, that interact with, with our center and that actually are active are sitting in the so-called informal um, low income spaces. So, so creativity is everywhere. Um, everybody's consuming, everybody's making. Um, but I think for me, that question is, is, is really, the way that I'd answer it is, is, is that it, it, it's, it's part of the reflection that we're also having around, what does art mean? How do, we, how do we describe, define, understand art within our own context? On this other question around official engagement coming after, you know, work starts by organizations like Michael and ourselves. There is a, a benefit in some sense, I think, because one of the one of the 
the opportunities we found it provides is that if we're strategic, we can get further along in our plans because of course the support is not coming from government at this point. So, so while you have support from, you know, from other well wishers and you do have a strategy and a plan, you can probably get further along and embed and enroot yourself a little bit more, more strategically before your government comes with other problems. And one of the big problems with the arts, of course, is censorship. So before the, the big acts of, um, of, um, of censorship and curtailing artistic freedom you know, comes around, hopefully you have built a community that can speak together, um, that, 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 that understands how to, how to lobby and, um, and make a case for itself. So yeah, so sometimes that sort of late engagement can be advantageous, but then once the engagement comes, I think as I was trying to express, the question is how do you get onto the same page? How are you both looking at the same thing? Um, how are you looking at it in a way that, that helps both of you move forward? And I think this is the space of, of challenge and difficulty that, that in our encounters, often we're not seeing things the same way or not even having the same idea around how to move it forward. Thanks, Joe. And I just, before Michael comes in, just want to, I mean, what strikes me in the tenor of the conversation and some of the questions and also what has come in previous weeks is that we, we are confronted by a dilemma in the African context where the theoretical frameworks and the language we have for understanding state sovereignty, state citizen interaction, the, the formations of participation, democracy, of course, has a very strong Western inheritance in the translation of that through the prism of colonialism, that's all been distorted. They're just a little bit off. And of course, they're part of a larger project of, uh, of, of subjugation and repression. On the other hand, there is an innate um, sort of uh, hybridization of these things. So they never, what they say, what they stand for, right? So they stand to be the state, but they're actually something slightly different. Social movements aren't quite social movements as uh, Charles Tilly would have theorized them. They something different, you know, they kind of, there's a religious dimension to them. The ancestors play a role, the traditional authorities get a nod um, and they all sort of, kind of cut through with, with, with popular culture, right? There's this, mm -hmm. there's this sort of viral, virulent obsession with the popular, uh, which, which you know, we can reframe as entrepreneurialism or as African beats or whatever. But the point is there's something else and we don't quite have mm. a precise language for these things. Yet when we listen and when we think and when we strategize about how do we make the next step, how do we move from here to there, we want things to be clear, to make sense, to be consistent with an inherited language. And so there's this gap, there's this, this, this duality between this inheritance we sit with, which is the words we speak with, especially when we have to speak English, and the reality that we know is on the ground and that all of you work with in an incredibly dynamic, intuitive, grounded, emergent way, which is something else, right? And so, so it is, I'm just so struck by, you know, how language fails us and our mm. conceptual registers fail us to, to really make sense of the civic, if you will. And even that concept in and of itself, mm. of course, is so overburdened with that same uh, a, a genealogy. So, so let me just kind of leave that reflection here as that, um, not for you to respond to per se, but I think to just move between some of the reflections in the chat function and what you've been saying and, and what that stirred in me. But Michael, the floor is yours. I mean, just to pick up on the question of, of the risk of um, the process of, of making becoming somehow the preserve of the middle class. I mean, just, just as a description, it, it's not the risk here because all the people we're working with who are making the things that we're making live in the communities that, that we are engaged with. Um, and the idea that somehow um, you need to be faced with a choice between a toilet and a song seems, seems strange 
much to me. Um, there, there's a question in, in, in the chat. Isn't there a risk of, uh, of uh, the arts seeming more important than sanitation? Why, why is that an either or? And I think at the root of it is the question of imagining, reimagining, giving vision to the city, the city yet to come. And so certainly in our, in our project, toilets and poetry are in the same bucket. And, and just, just a final uh, comment in response to a question about whether European taxpayers should be funding oil-rich Nigeria. I think it's important to understand that every year that the Nigerian economy has grown, so has the relative and absolute number of people living in poverty. And that while Nigeria is either the, the largest or the second largest economy on the continent, it is the country that contains the most people living in extreme poverty in the world. So it's, it's important to, to understand that the elite and the government is not identified with the, the nation. I'm done. Thanks. Um, uh, I don't know, uh, Gaetan, I see you've been furiously interacting in the chat function, responding to some of the comments. Uh, I don't know if you want to bring some of that into the conversation. And just to remind the participants, if anyone wants to, wants to articulate a view or perspective, ask a question or make a comment, uh, just raise your hand uh, using the Zoom function for that, and you will be unmuted. Uh, Gaetan, well, did you want to just come back? on the conversation or are you covered with you're fine okay um so i want to just then uh on the back of what's been raised um so so a couple of points have come out and i just want to make sure that oh sorry lorraine dongo has got a hand raised uh lorraine do you want to come in Yes, can you hear me? Welcome. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, thank you. Please introduce yourself and then ask your question or make your comment. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Lorraine and I'm currently in the United Kingdom. I'm just finishing off my PhD, focusing on uh, urban climate change resilience. So my area of focus is Beira in Mozambique. I just wanted to pick up on the issue of language that you spoke about earlier on. Mm -hmm. and. I do agree with the fact that this issue of language um, needs to be given more space. And the reason why I say this, because you find that most of the models that we tend to work with and operate with don't seem to create space whereby we can talk about these languages. So it's interesting that the Nairobi, Port Hakut, and even the Port Louis Development Initiative and uh, the Cape Town examples in all these models they've created a space to actually deliberate the language that they're using the kind of things that they want to do and then begin to engage and they're sort of all these are experiments but in most uh initiatives especially which come from the global level and they travel into these spaces there isn't any space for these things to happen you are funded for three years five years where is the space for us to begin to even break down this language so that we can begin to make sense? So I think they, to some extent, I feel that there is this deliberate process whereby we don't have these spaces where we can actually begin to make sense of the language and also to build on our process making. So I'm actually glad these case studies actually allow us to think outside the box. Joy was saying it's been 10 years. You know, it has taken them 10 years to do some of these different things. You know, it's fascinating, Michael, talking about all these different things, including, you know, which 
touch on different things. I'm from Zimbabwe originally and looking at our politics and looking at our young people, unemployment, one of the good examples whereby probably looking at Michael's work and Joy's work is to look at young people and the music that is coming up and how that space can be used to travel into some of these spaces. To, it could be sanitation, it could be housing, it could be all these other things. So really, how do we allow ourselves spaces to deliberate on this language so that other people outside these spaces, especially in the global West, can begin to understand our language and speak the same language so that when they engage with us, they're engaging with us using the language that can make a difference can transform our spaces. Otherwise, we just get money, we engage, we build these things. They're not sustainable. They work for some time, but we're in this constant cycle. So I don't know if that makes sense. I'm just rumbling on, but I just thought <laughs> out, instead of writing it down, I just thought <laughs> I would say yeah. it out. Yeah. Thank no, you. No, no, we, we, we don't want you to write an essay. You've got your PhD to finish. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's great that you made the remarks, Lorraine. It's, and they absolutely clear on point. And, it's a great segue for me to just signal uh, the focus of next week's conversation, uh, where the entry point will be this idea of, of, of alternative forms of regulation so that we can begin to subvert the deep code of our cities, right? So that we can begin to change the relations, the institutions, the nature of the conversations and so on. But one of the things that, uh, has become clear to me in preparing for the series and looking at um, precisely the limited resources available for serious, sustained, creative urban work is a discussion we need to have about how do we create, there's, a, there's a basically an institutional failure. Most African governments do not have a mechanism that is autonomous to support urban research and experimentation and learning in their contexts. And so it seems to me very clear that we need to, from this process at least, and through a collection of institutions, mount a campaign for to fix that institutional gap. Uh, and, um, and if, again, going back to where the money is going, which is infrastructure projects, there needs to be clarity that unless we can run these kinds of processes and experimentations that is rooted in these contexts, those investments are all gonna fail or they're gonna perform very poorly precisely because they're not embedded in their context. So it's in the interest of the larger system and these sort of big resource flows to just for us to just densify the knowledge and the experimentation and the practices across the continent funded off the national fiscus, not internationally, or through Pan-African institutions or a combination of those two. And I think the Mauritius case is so interesting because you've got, which is very exceptional, uh, unusual, where you've got a domestic private sector that is willing to invest in public interest goods and, and collective goods. And you know, how do we share that culture? Um, because what we are seeing is the emergence of an African philanthropy, but it is a kind of mirror image of the big man, right? So it's the Don Gorte Foundation, right? And you kind of need to know the networks to kind of get the Noe Ibrahim Foundation and so on. So how do we get, build a different culture, I guess? And I think, Lorraine, your point goes right to the heart of, of, um, of, 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 of what is needed and the mechanisms that we need to design an experiment with to, 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 to change that system. Um, yeah, so no, so you made a lot of sense. And as you can see, I now waffled on um, and should uh, make the effort of writing that up. But um, uh, who was next? One of you wanted to come in. Um, Michael or Joy? I wasn't sure if one of you raised the hand. Uh, some more comments and questions have come in in our chat box. Um, uh, um, so, uh, Michael, uh, there is a sort of uh, a, a sort of a stubborn persistence that there's something wrong with European taxpayers funding hip hop in Africa. Maybe you want to pick up on that point. Um, uh, and uh, um, I, 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 in the spirit of hip hop, it, 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 it requires a battle. So, you know, so do your thing. Um, yeah. And then uh, uh, if Joy Gaitan, if you want to pick up on any of the other comments in the chat function. Michael. 
you muted. You've got to unmute, unless that was oh, an artistic. Uh, yeah, you were making a point artistically, right? <laughs> the, the point is that ordinary citizens, ordinary people in Port Harcourt are subsidizing the hyperconsumption of middle class Londoners. Right, so whoever from London asks why should uh, the European taxpayer fund hip hop in Nigeria just simply needs to explore the material relationships between a city like Port Harcourt and a city like London. Both the contemporary relationships and the historical ones. And then the question would turn around and be, how much do ordinary Londoners owe to ordinary people in Port Harcourt in cash terms, in terms of, of transfers of, of resources and technology? A lot is the answer. So, uh, so just I'm just conscious of time and there's one question which I think is really pertinent and it'll be great to get a, a response from all three of you. Um, and that is that in these deliberative processes and in these experimental spaces where you've got competing and I guess conflictual positions, um, you know, sort of uh, how, how do you manage, how do you navigate that? And how do you make sure that they are able to produce an outcome and that outcome is productive and that there's buy-in? Maybe each of you can share an experience or a reflection on that question or comment. Um, uh, yes, one, uh, this, this issue of competing needs and, and also to engage the, the private sector to, to fund and to invest, we, we, we approach that this way. The whole city is an asset and the city is composed of private space and public space, but the public space doesn't yield the same benefits as the private space do. So what if the private sector could be involved in the public domain and then make this lease it from government and then make it yield more? And uh, we change law. We change the law to enable that to happen, to enable private management of public space which is now possible. And if the people invest in front of their own shop, their pavement, they put traffic light, they put uh, lighting, security, cameras, uh, they do redo the pavement, the streets, the landscaping, urban furniture, they can deduct it from their own company taxes. And this is working now because we engage them not only they deduct it from their taxes and they do they improve what the municipality do not have the budget for but secondly their own private asset is getting value by doing so and little by little area streets are moving into directions like this so this is uh, we believe uh, relying on ourselves instead of having, you know, Europe or whoever trying to help us with aid or fun. Thank you. Thank you. Joy? Yeah, I guess um, maybe one, one area of contention that we experience as we engage with, particularly the, um, the, the city authorities um, in, their, in their planning, uh, strategies is, is their prioritization really of infrastructure at this particular point in time. And we enter the space trying to talk about people and trying to talk about the social and the cultural as another way to, to approach the whole question of city making. And I think that in that case, the, the, you know, the negotiations continue. And I think what we're trying to say, or the, the, the way that we're trying to look at this is to say that if we, if we can own the city, if we can feel that we inhabit the city confidently, surely the infrastructure that we build will be a reflection of both. In other words, that it's a successful merger of our own social and cultural identities and selves reflected in the way that the city manifests physically and in terms of infrastructure. So, but this is a process of conversation and negotiation. So, so that is the space that I find we're always battling 
um, in, in, in our engagements with, with, with city authorities at this particular point in time when we're looking at, at, at urban planning particularly. Great, thanks. Thanks, Joy. Michael? Well, I think in many ways what we're trying to do is to arrive at the point where we've created the conditions of possibility for these kinds of uh, contentious entanglements. Um, because at the moment, in a city like Port Harcourt, you have the urban majority, which for the most part make the city and, and live the city. And then you have a, an urban elite, which just extract value. An elite which actively doesn't, for example, want a tax framework to be built up because that would encourage accountability. It's explicitly and deliberately focused on, on extraction. So I, I think one of the things we're trying to do is, is create a, a cultural space and a physical cultural space too, in which collective resources, including natural ecosystems, urban ecosystems, and, and space are, are valued as such to create a sense of, of the collective. And then hopefully we can have some of these, these discussions. These discussions would be a luxury. Thank you. Um, so I just want to make one concluding remark um, <clears throat> from this and what I was struck by and, and I didn't anticipate this um, before the session and, and putting it together is the extent to which all of you play with this uh, continuum of different uh, um, civic engagement tools, whether it be protest, um, experimentation with alternatives, co-production of, of, of service delivery approaches or infrastructures or public spaces. And, and, uh, and very tellingly for me and very significant, this question of, uh, of regulation and legal enablement to, to, to understand that laws aren't fixed, they're not immutable. And in fact, they have to be dynamic things and they need to be sites of contestation and that they are meant to serve society, not constrain society. And, um, but there's a certain flexibility, imaginative capacity, I think that is called for to understand that this is a toolbox and that a close and grounded reading of the challenge of the context of the site of the community is what will guide one as to how to deploy these different tools. Um, and it is remarkable the consistency, I think across the four stories, the four narratives, the four sites of today uh, about this. And I think that there's something broader that we could probably speculate about as we try and figure out what does it mean to place the civic and civic empowerment at the heart of this transformation agenda. So uh, please uh, accept our utmost gratitude and thanks for being with us today, to sharing generously, and most importantly, just you know keeping up the good fight right to just do this work day in day out year in year out um as uh, lorraine said i think it is so important that we've got reference points for what's possible um and of course uh, the challenge now is to connect these reference points uh, which hopefully the series is 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 a small contribution to so i want to then invite the participants to please join us for the final conversation next week um which is uh, titled Innovative Regulation. Surprise, surprise, given what I've said earlier. Um, and what's its connection with transformative politics. And uh, we've invited an honorary African, <laughs> um, Indy Joha from Dark Matter Labs to, uh, to, to kind of kick us off. And I really want to encourage folks to join us. He is a trip uh, and he will blow your minds. And we then have some senior African urbanists, uh, Mark Swilling, Omar Silia, and Sue Parnell uh, to respond to his provocations. And that will then bring our sessions to an end. And then just to finally say, uh, today's conversation has been uh, streamed live on Facebook, but it will be up on YouTube within a few days. And the first three conversations are already there. And uh, on behalf then of 
uh, our partners, uh, Alfred Herrhaus and Gashalska for Dark Matter Labs, Peak Urban and Gothenburg Center for Sustainable Development. I wanna thank everyone for joining us again and also my colleague Alma Vavias for ensuring that uh, it all happened and that we could even serve the technical glitches uh, with a little bit of elegance. So thanks everyone and speak soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye.